as Anna says, you're going to have a feast of uh, insights into the current state of brain research from the eminent speakers today, but you have to start with me. Um, I'm going to tell you um, essentially about how views of the brain, some of the views of the brain have changed so radically during uh, my time in, in neuroscience. Uh, when I was a medical student, you know, only a hundred years ago, um, I, I learned absolute facts about the brain which stuck with me for a long time. They were hard to displace, but many of them have been radically changed by developments in, in neuroscience. And I want to tell you about, about some of them. Uh, look at the, the picture, I guess, that while you've been waiting for the talk, some of you have been looking at the illustration that I chose for my title slide. One of the most familiar images in Western art. Many of you will have seen it, of course. It's the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo's magnificent fresco. Um, I wonder why there aren't a lot of you who are already agitated. Have you noticed there's something wrong with this picture? How many of you see anything wrong? There are a few hands, there are a few hands, maybe 5%, 5%. Okay. Um, in reality, the real image is like this. If you look up at God, you'll see he's quite different in the view you've seen. It's not God, it's Charles Darwin. Um, it, it could have been Richard Dawkins, but that would have been more obvious. <laughs> Look, this is, as I said, one of the most familiar views that you've had. You must have seen it time after time reproduced in uh, art books and, you know, Sunday newspaper magazines and so on. It should be absolutely indelibly fixed in your head. But it's not. You missed a major error in the most distinctive feature of the, of, of the picture. So one obvious question is, can we, can we really trust um, our, our vision? So the first of the myths that I want to tell you about is that seeing is believing. Something that I was told as an anecdote you know, long before I went to medical school. Skiing, seeing, believe you can be really sure of what you see. So vision is our, uh, certainly our most developed sensory system. About a third of your cerebral cortex, one third of your entire cerebral cortex, which has expanded so much in human beings, is devoted to the analysis of information that reaches your, your eyes. We depend on vision hugely for what we do, how we navigate in the world, how we recognize other people and objects and so on, but it is not infallible. Uh, another little demonstration. What I want you to do is when I show you the next picture, I want you all to put your hand up as soon as you recognize what the picture is. It's going to be difficult to, to see, but as soon as you, you understand it, put your hand up and hold your hand up continuously, okay? Let, let's do it. One or two of you have seen it before, I'm pretty sure of that. There are two, three, four, five hands, six. Not many, still not many, oh, this is going up, still another one. People are beginning to see the picture. More? More going up, maybe 10% of the audience, many people not. Let me give you a hint. So there's the hint. That's the hint. Now keep your hands up, please, if you can see it, because I want, to, I want you all to see how long it takes. Now let's go back to the picture. More people, yes, lots more people. So, just a minute. Vision is something that comes from your eyes, from looking at things. How can it come from hints? I could have said it's a cow, and it would have had the same effect. Many people are now seeing it. Not everybody, by the way, which is slightly alarming. Um, okay, so you can put your hands down now. The, all right, don't be ashamed of the fact it took a long time, but this, it's a difficult picture to see. There's not much information. But it does show you, I think, prove to yourself that vision can be a job to be done. It can be work for you to do, to try to understand something. We're unfamiliar with that because when we, normally when we open our eyes, we just see it and it's, and it's there. We see the world instantly in all its richness, the colors and the forms and the shapes, the movements, the people, the faces and so on. In fact, it's a laborious task and that can be vividly demonstrated by making it even more difficult than the normal thing. The normal thing is difficult enough, and we do that extremely, extremely well. Another, another example of, of uh, which, well, another example which again will, will uh, I think, make you question the reliability of your own uh, vision. Imagine you're driving along the road, and 
although it looks like a beautifully sunny day, uh, there's water on the road, and suddenly mud splashes onto your windscreen. So watch your windscreen, wait for the mud, there's the mud. Did you notice anything else apart from the, the, the synthetic mud? Anybody? One, two, three people, two or three people only? Well, let's just replay it without the mud. I'll show you the two frames that I've just shown you, but without the splodges on, okay? So here it is again. That was the transition. But because of the presence of those blobs, all, virtually all of you failed to see it. It's a, it's a massively strong visual stimulus hitting your retina, certainly influencing enormous numbers of nerve cells in your, in your visual cortex, all screaming away something's happened to that line on the road, you don't see it. You're distracted if you like, your attentional system is diverted to something which seems more unusual and novel, takes all of your, the machinery of your your processing of, uh, of vision, and you don't miss the obvious thing. This is one example of a, a whole range of extraordinary phenomena called change blindness, described in the last 20 years, in which dramatic changes in the visual scene can, for many people, go unnoticed, um, unless they are the center of attention at the time just before the change occurs. So although we have the impression that we're living in a high-resolution, real-time video of what's happening around us, that we're aware of absolutely everything, we're not, and you can prove it that way. Moreover, uh, there's reason even to question what we, what we are aware of. Um, the, um, the, traditionally, and what I learned as a medical student, is that vision works by what the technical people would call a feed-forward process. Information hits your retina, there are connections from your retina back into your brain, actually to the back of your brain here, where there is an area, in fact there are lots of different areas that are processing that information that's come in. So here we're looking at a very simplified view of how that's organized in the brain of a rhesus monkey, an old world monkey, pretty similar um, to the organization of a human brain, just quite a lot smaller. And you can see that at the, at the back of the brain, there's this region called V1, this is the back of the brain, that the front of the brain is pointing to the right. Information from the eyes comes in almost entirely into V1, but it's redistributed across the whole of the back of the cerebral hemispheres, upwards towards the parietal cortex, downwards into the lower part of the temporal uh, lobe. And here are some of those regions that have been identified with the, with the descriptions, the, the terms that are used to describe them over here on the left. Um, each of these these regions reprocesses the information that's come from the eyes. Interesting question, why reprocess it? What can be gained just by churning through the numbers again and again, you might say. This is not the sort of thing a computer um, would do, but, it, but it's an example of, of what I'll come to a little later uh, of um, the different principles of computation in, in the brain. Anyway, the idea was that the information comes into the first visual area, some of the information is extracted, it then gets pushed on into other areas and other areas and other areas, and finally shoots out at the end like water out of a hose and goes into the rest of the brain and does things like causing visual experiences or, or resulting in movements towards objects that you can see and so on. Views have changed really quite a, quite a lot. Um, the uh, the uh, evidence that these different regions, at least some of them, uh, seem to be specialized for extracting particular sorts of visual information is interesting. Because what it implies is that our apparently coherent view of a visual scene, of all the objects in it, the colors, the forms, the distances, the motion, and so on, all of which seems to cohere into a single experience, is actually, initially anyway, composed of a lot of independently analyzed features of the scene, the color, and the, the movement, the form, specifically the recognition of faces and so on, as you'll see in a moment. That raises interesting questions about where the putting together of the experience um, occurs. If it, if it does, if there is anything which is anatomically or physiologically um, uh, comparable with, 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 the, with putting together um, uh, different fragments of an experience. Okay, uh, one of the big developments since I was a medical student, because the first publication was in 1990, um, was um, uh, the, the various methods for measuring activity in, in the human brain, in the living human brain. 
functional magnetic resonance imaging perhaps being the most familiar of them. This is a technique, a non-invasive um, technique, MR scanning, in which essentially water molecules and hydrogen molecules in the, in the tissue are detected and analyzed. So it can be used to measure changes in blood flow, for instance. So imagine you put someone into a, a brain scanner and you ask them to look at that displayed on a screen in front of them, in front of them a static pattern of light and dark dots on a background. It's not moving, and you find which part of their brain has increased blood flow as a result of seeing that pattern compared with not seeing it. And uh, it's nice to see that the major increase in activity shown by the red and the yellow areas on this imaginary scan, imaginary section, horizontal section through the brain, the major activities at the back of the brain, areas that we know are receiving information from, uh, from the eyes. That's good. What would be very surprising to uh, so let's say a 19th century neurologist who knew nothing about these additional visual areas really, is that if you now show the same person the same dots moving around on the screen and you ask the computer that's doing the analysis, show me bits of the brain which are more active, more active when the person's looking at the movement than when they're not, uh, then this is the picture you get. Um, it depends on how you set the threshold for registering those colors and so on. But there seems to be uh, another region further forward, just above the ears here, called MT, the middle temporal area, from studies in monkeys. It was first described in, in monkeys. Um, or V5, sometimes in humans, the fifth visual area. A region that seems to be specifically devoted to, an to analyzing movement in the, in, in the visual field. Um, there's some evidence that damage to that region in people on both sides of the brain. So it's very rare to have a stroke that affects just that region on both sides, but can lead to a con condition called akinetopsia, in which um, people have normal color vision, normal vision of form and space and so on, uh, but they seem unable usually to detect movement. They simply don't see movement. If something moves in front of them, they see it in one position, they see it in a new position, they don't see it in between. They have no sense of it, of it moving, and that's specifically associated with the damage to, to this um, region. So that's just one example of a dedicated area, probably the best described area, specifically, actually, mainly through the study of, of animals through monkeys, where the properties of the individual nerve cells have been studied in great detail, committed to processing um, movement. Um, there's less complete information about dedicated responsibility in other areas. I'll show you one example. If, you, again, you put a person into the scanner, or a number of people into the scanner, and you show them randomly um, these uh, various photographs of this type, either photographs of real people, of their faces, full face or profile, or photographs of manufactured objects, um, and they're interleaved, randomly appearing, staying on the screen for about 10 seconds, let's say. And then afterwards, you ask the computer to show you the parts of the brain that on, it's, were statistically more strongly activated, more increase in blood, for the face images than for the object images, and vice versa. Um, it depends where you take the section through the brain, but this is one image. It shows you the region in orange, Actually, most strongly activated on the right-hand side of the brain, and perhaps Stanislas Tahan will tell us something about that. Um, the, this, the region in, in, in the lower part uh, of the visual areas entering the temporal cortex of the brain, low down here, a region called the fusiform gyrus. That region, there's a lot of evidence that that region is committed to understanding, interpreting face images very specifically. Again, first described in monkeys, but a lot of evidence in humans, partly from the effects of damage. Damage to that region can interfere selectively with the recognition of, of faces. And in this particular section, you see very nearby the blue area in a region called parahippocampal gyrus, which in this experiment was more strongly activated by the object images. It turns out that other regions responded more to objects than faces, and the evidence for a, a dedicated area to recognizing manufactured objects is much less strong than a dedicated area for motion analysis or for face um, analysis. But here we are with two regions of the brain that appear in some way to be differently committed to analyzing visual um, images. Faces are very important in our lives recognizing other people. We have a very wide circle of people whom we, we can recognize, and it's important that we do recognize them, respond to them appropriately. We're very social animals. The commitment of 
so much of our visual system to the detection of faces has uh, one problem, that it tends to make us hypersensitive to faces that appear in the scene. We have a tendency to want to see faces, to look for t the tiniest evidence of a face in the scene. I'll show you an example. This lovely um, uh, image um, shows uh, uh, a, s a view of a surface, um, and the hint of a, of, a, of a face here is so strong, and perhaps a second one down, down here. These are, in fact, images from the, um, the Viking uh, mission, the orbiter of, of, um, of Mars, the first Viking probe, 1976. Um, and these are rock formations on the surface of Mars. As it happens, this is 400 kilometers long. It's just a, a, a mountainous uh, structure. But all of the popular press was full of headlines about faces on the surface of, of Mars, and it's just very difficult not to see it as a face, as the philosopher Wittgenstein you know, distinguished between just seeing things and seeing them as something, as objects. Our brains are made to interpret just meaningless things, light and dark images in the retina, in terms of the objects that they might uh, represent and come from. I'll show you another um, example I saw in a, in a newspaper. I don't read the, these sorts of newspapers very often, but there we are. This just seems so striking, really, that the face of Jesus was found on a frying pan. Um, and here's the frying pan. Um, after cooking a, a, a meal, and somehow the fat and the residue is being deposited to produce this wonderful picture, picture of, of Jesus, complete with beard and crown of thorns and, and everything. Um, it was a little bit of a dilemma for the people who discovered it. Oh, by the way, the, the newspaper had some interesting ideas for what you might cook in such a frying pan. Um, the, the Last Supper being the most, most obvious one. <clears throat> but the... Um, the couple who found it in, uh, in, uh, in the United States had this dilemma. The, the gravel worker who found it said that he was discussing it with his wife and with his son. We might well sell it, but we're really not sure what to do at the moment. We're still a little bit shocked about it all. Two months ago, a woman from Florida who discovered an image of the Virgin Mary in her toasted cheese sandwich sold it on eBay <coughs> for 14,000 pounds. So we, we see things that don't necessarily always correspond to what's out in the world. This means that we're inventing the world we live in. We need eyes, of course, close your eyes, and there is no world. Well, even when you close your eyes, it's possible internally to create a sort of visual world. If you just close your eyes and think about looking at a face, or think about looking at a moving pattern, you can be sure that there is activity in those parts of your visual cortex at the back here, which would normally respond if you were actually looking at a moving object or a face. We seem to be able to somehow internally, top down, as they say, to turn on activity in very early sensory areas to simulate or to reproduce, approximately, the sort of activity that would, 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 would happen if you were really looking at such a thing. You can, re you can internally create sort of visual experiences. Moreover, you can carry on being able to do that even if you've been blind for, with the people in, the, in this study of mine, 20 years or more. So this is a study of what's called visual imagery, the, the capacity to imagine seeing things in normal people, uh, sighted people, and in blind people. Um, here's the group of sighted people who were asked to imagine that they were looking at something that's moving actually uh, curtains being drawn across a window in front of them. Their eyes were closed, they were just imagining it, but here's very strong activity in that region MT or V5, which we've just seen is normally strongly activated by actually looking at moving things. So the brain is simulating the real experience from inside. Equally, if you ask them to imagine a face, here's the right fusiform face area activated by imagining looking at a face. If you, if you do that in someone who's been blind from birth, congenitally blind, well, frankly, they don't understand the instructions, of course, because they've never had visual experiences. And there's no activity, localized activity, in, in their visual cortical region. But for people who became blind later in life, typically around the age of four or five, and who've been blind for at least 20 years, they can still do this. 
I, I mean, I was amazed when we did this experiment as a preliminary to another one I'll describe in a moment, asking people to imagine. I, I thought this would be extremely difficult for blind people. It's clearly not, and all their body language tells you that they are having these experiences, although they've had no real visual experience for 20 years. And here they are activating, very strongly activating V5, MT, when they imagine motion, and activating the fusiform face area when they imagine a face. So we can turn on our experiences, if you like, from inside, and in fact, an emerging view in visual neuroscience, shocking to me because I've worked in it from a different perspective through most of my career, is that what we experience is much more generated from within than from outside. The brain is creating on the basis of fragmentary evidence coming in from the eyes, which grows over time as we look around a scene. It's creating an internal hypothesis about what's happening in the outside world. And that's being propagated back downwards into the visual system, and the incoming information is checked against the brain's own model of what's happening. And only when there are differences between the two is the model updated. It's a very, very different concept of how we, we, we see. Let me show you one very striking example from uh, Lars Mukli's group in, in Glasgow. What, what he did was to ask people in the scanner to look at three different scenes, one containing people, another containing a car, the view from a car, and the third, a boat. And he looked, simply looked time after time, as these images were randomly exposed, at activity across the visual areas of the cortex. And here's a region of the visual cortex that was activated by those patterns. But in some of the trials, he simply covered and occluded one quadrant of the image, this lower right-hand half, part of the uh, image. So that means that a big chunk of the visual system was receiving no input at all, because the eyes weren't seeing any, anything in that region. The person was asked to look exactly in the middle here. And he defined the region, and it's shown here in green, in the first two visual areas, V1 and V2, corresponding to this area that wasn't actually seeing the target in these, in these conditions. But he found, by very a, comp a very clever algorithm for looking at the activity and from it seeing whether that patch of cortex, the activity in that cortex told you that the, that the brain was distinguishing between these three patterns, showed that this region was still able, this region of the cortex, which wasn't being stimulated at all from the eyes, was still able to tell whether the person was looking at a picture of people, a picture of cars, or a, pic a picture of a boat. So the information around it, going into the rest of the cortex, must somehow be informing parts of the cortex that have no visual information, telling them what to expect, telling them what the pattern is, and that's reflected in the activity you can de detect with MRI. So vision is um, an even more complicated process than we thought, but, but significantly, it is much more generated from within than we, than we think. Our visual experiences seem to come from inside us rather than directly from outside us. First myth, then, seeing is believing a lot of doubt about that. The second, we use only 10% of our brains. You see this time and again. I had an email message this morning. Um, uh, the header was, uh, you can now activate 100% of your brain, learn how. And, uh, of course, there's uh, you know, a link that you wouldn't dare to click, which is going to reveal how to get this complicated formula that's suddenly going to turn on the whole of the, your brain and make you a, um, a genius. Where does this come from? A lot of speculation about, um, uh, about where it might have come from. It's not, um, it's not that obvious. Uh, I think that one of the, 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 the possibilities um, is that the numbers of neurons that exist in the brain and the amount of connectivity is so huge, it's difficult to imagine all of it being used all the time. These are the sorts of numbers that most of you will nowadays be familiar with. Um, the current estimates suggest there are something just less than 100 billion neurons in the human brain. That's um, about half the number of stars in our galaxy. So, you know, it's a very, very big number. But it pales into insignificance compared with the number of connections between those nerve cells because they, some estimates suggest that individual cells, on average, have 10,000 connections from other cells, through, through synapses, through the junctions between nerve cells, from the fibers of nerve cells onto other nerve cells. That's a more controversial number, but if, let's assume it's, it's correct for the moment. That means that altogether there are 10 to the 15 connections. That is a very, very, very big number inside your head. Um, in fact, it's equivalent 
to um, one million connections for every second of the duration of human life. Um, now, that's not a, a process which is regularly distributed across life, although there is increasing evidence that synaptic connections are being made all the time through life, even into old age, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but, the, but the total number of connections that has to be made is quite extraordinary. I mean, the making and breaking of connections is an intrinsic part of how our brains work. Um, the... I think we'll hear some of that from other speakers, but uh, one of the trends in current neuroscience is to try to analyze comprehensively the number... This is, this is from a... This video is from a study at MIT based on uh, comprehensive analysis of, of serial electron microscopic sections of a tiny fragment of cortex. This is not fantasy. This is not just CGI. It's, it's, it's the reality of the connections around the dendrites of one neuron in the cortex of a mouse. It just shows you how complex it is. People take, with these kinds of techniques hope that by understanding all of the connectivity within little bits of the cortex, it might be possible to work out uh, what it's doing, what the connections between cells are doing, what it's computing, what it's processing. And, and, and that is one approach to understanding much more about how the brain works. Frankly, I think that the 10% myth might have come from the state of knowledge of the brain in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, and this is a 19th century illustration of the human brain. And on it, I've superimposed approximately what was known at the time. There are committed regions of the cortex which are quite, quite clearly doing particular jobs. And they're doing jobs related to the senses, uh, to the major senses, and to the control of movement. So here, one of the first observations was that uh, there's a strip running downwards in the cerebral hemispheres here, affected by uh, stroke um, that, that uh, um, affects the uh, artery that su supplies that part of the cortex and can produce paralysis of the muscles and often, if it's on the left, problems with speech. That region's involved in the control of movement. And the body, the muscles of the body, are mapped out, if you like, across that region with the head um, represented down towards the bottom of that gyrus and the hands and the feet up at the top. Next to it, there's another strip just behind it, the post-central gyrus, which receives information from the body surface and the deep tissues, the sensory information coming in, uh, in a parallel map of the body uh, from the cutaneous and other receptors uh, in the body. I've labeled it um, touch, but it's it, all the other um, touch sensations are included. Vision, I've told you a lot about already, is localized at the back, and at the time, uh, it was thought to be only that that region, the posterior pole, the first visual area, they didn't know about these other surrounding regions, although there were hints that people with damage in surrounding regions had strange sorts of visual defects, but not blindness. Damage of V1, complete elimination of V1 with a, a stroke of the posterior cerebral artery, um, uh, can, can produce blindness, cortical um, visual blindness. Um, and finally, a, a region devoted to hearing here in the temporal lobe. That might be perhaps 10% of the surface of the brain. And the rest was even by some neurologists called silent cortex or uncommitted cortex, as if it's just sitting there waiting for something to do when those other regions are active, perhaps looking at the activity between them and integrating it in some way. I think this is where perhaps the 10%, maybe where the 10% myth came from. Or also when Wild, Wilder Penfield, a very eminent Canadian neurosurgeon um, at his peak of activity in the 30s and 40s developed methods for stimulating the human cortex in patients in preparation for surgery on epileptic uh, foci, stimulated the cortex while they were awake under local anesthetic. Um, he was able to describe the experiences that they had or the movements that they produced as different parts of their brain were, were stimulated. This is one of his pictures. And I should say, I know this is a general audience, so some of you are scientists and, and some of you are probably not. For those who are not, um, unfortunately, the real human brain doesn't come with the little numbers um, on, on it. It would be very nice if it did, but, but these are numbers that just indicate where, where Penfield has stimulated while listening to what this person, who owns this brain, lying there in the bed, 
experienced when their cortex was stimulated. He found that large parts of the cortex produce no obvious movement and no obvious sensation. Again, a kind of indication that it's not doing anything. Well, it, it is. I mean, how could, you know, how could it just be wasted? The brain is wasted. But on the other hand, how could it all be doing things all the time? Because then there would be no capacity to discriminate between different events in life between seeing things or hearing things or moving things or thinking about different objects or speaking, whatever. The fact that we can do such a wide repertoire of things must mean that we have different capacities for patterns of activity in our heads. I mean, an interesting, important fact here is the brain is an energetically very expensive organ. About 20%, 25% of the glucose and the oxygen in your bloodstream is consumed by your brain which is a powerful constraint on the way in which brains have evolved. And it's also a reason for why we should be puzzled by the fact that our brains are so big. They've escaped somehow from that evolutionary constraint. They're very hungry. The reason they're hungry is because it takes a lot of energy to run nerve cells, particularly to generate nerve impulses. And there are calculations that only about 3%, 3% of the neurons in the human brain can be producing a nerve impulse at the same time. There isn't enough energy for more of them to do that. So there's been great pressure on the brain using uh, codes of representation which are as sparse and economical as possible, which minimize the actual transmission of, of information. So that's perhaps a more significant and interesting aspect of the 10% myth. The next myth, the brain is not a computer. And I, and I certainly, uh, you, you're coming to tell me to stop. And I've only got to the three myths, so I've got to go very much faster. Right, the brain is not a computer. Well, let me give you one example of uh, I mean, the one problem is that, that when we don't understand something in science, we often work by analogy to things that we do understand. So it's not surprising that the comparison with computers has become quite a dom dominant theme in, in neuroscience. Uh, and I think what we'll end up by saying is that, well, of course, the brain isn't like a conventional digital desktop computer. But if we de define a computer as being a device which receives information, processes that information, and makes decisions, then, of course, the brain's a computer. We just have to redefine what a computer is. Now, remember the, um, that empty area which responds to movement in the visual scene. Well, the one problem in understanding how that works, and this is an example of computation, is that um, movement on the retina can be caused either by re objects really moving in the scene in front of us or much more frequently by our own eye movements. As we move our eyes around the scene, and obviously the image is moving across the retina, how does the brain tell the difference between those two? Because we're normally unaware of our own eye movements, and we simply see the real movements in the world. This is an experiment that uh, Loredana Santoro, who's a graduate student of mine, did. She asked people in the scanner to look, first of all, at that pattern, a classic pattern for producing a lot of activity in the human motion area. She asked them to look at the little cross, and therefore, their retina was being stimulated with the moving lines. And lo and behold, there was massive activity, as you see below, in this empty region. But she then asked them to look at this. Look at the cross. The lines are stationary on the screen in front of them, but their eyes are tracking backwards and forwards in exactly the same way that the lines were in the first experiment. So the lines are moving on their retina in just the same way. As far as the retina is concerned, it's the same stimulus. As far as MT is concerned, it's not. There's little or no activity in MT. MT, MT is doing some kind of simple algebra. It's looking at an internal signal telling it what the eyes were doing, generated inside, comparing it with what's coming in from the retina, and saying, no, no, there's no movement in the outside world. It's entirely caused by me moving my eyes. And interesting, therefore, so when they saw this, moving their eyes at the same speed as the bars were moving, which you see as moving, if you do it now, look at the cross, move backwards and forwards, of course the bars are moving. But if you think about it, they're not moving on your retina. If you're tracking accurately, then the bars are stationary on your retina. But you see them as moving, and lo and behold, when, these peop when people look at that, there is activity in MT, even though there's no significant retinal stimulation. So MT is generating a signal that correlates with what the person sees and with the reality of movement outside in the world. Another example of computation, uh, I told you about the two areas that respond to faces, and in this case, objects. What then if someone looks at a pattern like that on the right, which is ambiguous, which can look either like a pair of faces in profile or a white vase? 
and it alternates spontaneously. And you've seen this before, I'm sure. We put people in the scanner and ask them to press a button when it flipped into a vase, and another button when it turned back into faces, time after time after time, to see whether there was any change in activity in those two regions that correlated with the internally generated change of interpretation. The image isn't changing, but the perception is. And we found that in the face area, MT, there were clear, very large differences in activity caused by a change in perception into a face, a much bigger response compared to a change in perception back to a, a vase. There were no such differences in the area labeled objects. This is good evidence, I think, that that area is actually not in the mainstream of processing to the perception of objects, even though it responds more to, to seeing objects than seeing faces. I'm nearly there. I'll do it very quickly. No new nerve cells are created after birth. Now, this really was dogma. The brain generates all its nerve cells. Very rapid proliferation from stem cells initially in the brain creates all of the brain. Uh, and then, actually in humans, some considerable time, time later, after gestation, baby's born, everything's downhill from then. No nerve cells are generated. In fact, the old myth was that they start to die immediately and carry on dying throughout, throughout life. Um, and certainly no possibility of repair or regeneration and so on. Well, again, all of that is gone. Not, not to say that everywhere in the brain is growing all the time and making new neurons all the time. Interestingly, the neurogenesis that we know about in the adult brain is restricted to very particular regions, one in especially. And that is a region called the hippocampus, which you're going to hear more about very soon. It's a region inside the temporal lobe of the brain, that structure which is wrapped around this strange curved shape. And it's been known for quite some time from brain damage that that region's very much involved in memory in, in humans, particularly personal episodic conscious memories of experiences that you've had, um, but also uh, spatial memory as well. And, and uh, in a, a remarkable study by Eleanor Maguire and her colleagues in, in, in London, um, they showed that um, activity, and you see it, the yellow blob there in the picture on the, on the left, in the right hippocampus specifically, that was activity that was generated when people were doing a simulated navigation task in the computer while being brain scanned, remembering a map structure that they'd learned before. And interestingly, that region of the brain in humans can physically change its dimensions if memory is hugely exercised. And Eleanor looked specifically at, at London cab drivers uh, as an example of people who've had to acquire a huge amount of spatial Im information. Um, I mean, their knowledge of the topography of London is quite extraordinary. They typically have to study for two years driving around London to get to know it all. And during that two-year period, she showed that the posterior part of the right hippocampus increases in size, in the, in, as you see it in the, in the scanner. I'm not suggesting, and I don't believe it, that that is largely due to an incre increase in the number of nerve cells, but it's certainly due to an increase in something, perhaps connectivity uh, between cells. So the notion that the brain can continue to, to grow and to change has become an absolutely dominant one in neuroscience. I mean, here we are looking at more um, specific and convincing evidence from, from mice on the right-hand side, but, but there is evidence for this in humans too, that new neurons, and the, these are the cells that you can see labeled in, in red here, are being generated throughout life um, uh, in the hippocampal uh, region. And moreover, that the rate of generation can be changed by things that happen to the mouse or to the rat, um, particularly um, exercise. A mouse that has access to an exercise wheel generates much, uh, um, at a much higher rate new neurons that become incorporated into its hippocampus than one that doesn't. An equally a stressed mouse produces fewer neurons. And there's a, there are certainly strong hints of a relationship between neurogenesis and a, a variety of conditions in humans, exercise, um, depression, um, anxiety, the beginnings of neurodegenerative diseases of, of, of various types all seem to affect uh, neurogenesis quite critically. It's not known the extent to which the, those changes are critical in the pathogenic process, part of generating the disease, but they certainly seem to, to happen. Now, I'm, I know I'm under pressure, and, I, and you, you know perfectly well that I have um, a number of slides because I'm only up to four, so let me go very quickly. Here we are. 
recovery after brain damage is impossible. That's what I was taught after a stroke, after a section of the spinal cord or whatever. There's no chance, there's no hope. Well, as we'll see from some of the talks today, there is hope, not necessarily hope of regrowth and regeneration, but the ingenuity of technology can help people with brain, brain damage. But we shouldn't, even, we shouldn't underestimate the capacity of the, of the human adult nervous system to attempt to reorganize itself in response to its own experiences, the things that happen to it, even after um, injury such as stroke. And I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to... Um, um, miss some of the preliminary evidence, but it starts with early development and it's very clear that animals early in life, including human beings, go through a period of weeks or months or years in which the sensory parts of the brain are changing dramatically as a result uh, of incoming experience and reorganizing to match their characteristics, if you like, to the, to the statistics of the world around them. Just one example in, 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 in the mouse, the whiskers are a very, very important part of the touch system. And it's not surprising then when you look at the touch area of the cortex, this is the region that I showed you in the human brain, equivalent to the post-central gyrus, with a sort of map of the mouse body on it. There's a huge region which is receiving information from the whiskers. Um, and you can see the pattern of the whiskers on this diagram. You can't just see it on the diagram, you can see it on the brain. This is a horizontal section parallel to the surface of the brain, showing these rings of nerve cells in an adult mouse, and the arrangement of those, those rings corresponds to the pattern of whiskers on the other side of the face, because each side of the brain receives information from the opposite side of the body. This pattern of distribution of nerve cells and connections isn't present at birth. It emerges during the first week, and it depends on the activity that's coming in from the whiskers. And actually, uh, uh, we un understand a lot now about the molecular mechanisms responsible for forming it. So, for instance, in a mouse in which one row of whiskers has been cut and trimmed and therefore not stimulated, in a baby mouse, if you look at the mouse when it grows up, it's missing, you can see from the arrow, one of these rows of, of ring-shaped structures. So their production depends on activity coming in to the cortex. In humans, I won't even try and explain the huge variety of related phenomena that occur even much later in life. But here's just one study. This is from a group of children, I mean adolescents, playing computer games for the first time in their lives. Quite difficult to find subjects for this sort of experiment, but kids playing computer games at first. For a few minutes a day, these kids learnt to play Tetris. Simple computer game, right, um, on the screen. A week late, they were scanned at the beginning and scanned after a week. They'd been playing the game, getting to know it for a while. And the areas that are shown in color here are areas in which the gray matter of the cortex had detectably and statistically changed in thickness. Again, rather like the hippocampus, ch structural changes being produced by, by activity. Um, much more dramatic changes. Can let me just describe one example from my own lab. Again, in blind people, and you'll remember that in blind people who've had vision early in life, their capacity to have visual experiences still exists. They can turn them on from inside. And it turns, it turns out that although they can't see, they can turn on equivalent activity in their visual areas by touching things. This is the, um, this is ex the experiment. First of all, I, we scanned people in, this, in normal sighted people viewing either faces or moving patterns. And you can see the activity produced here. MT on the left, fusiform face area on the right, as you'd expect in normal sighted people. We then blindfolded the sighted people and compared them with blind people, late blind people, and touched their hands with a doll's head that felt like a face when it was put into their hand. Or a scrambled doll's head that felt like nothing but had all the same surface features. And we either kept it static or moved it around. So we could ask, is there any part of the brain in a late blind person which responds when their skin feels a moving object or when their skin feels a face? And the answer is the visual areas the comparable visual areas, the motion area and the face area. So there seems to be the possibility of taking over one part of the brain by another. And finally, very quickly, the human brain has unique abilities. We like to think that. We, think, we like to think we're special. 
Um, <laughs> we're, we're able, for instance, to pick up very subtle social signals from, from other people around us. <laughs> Certainly the human brain is distinctive in its size, although recent work suggests that it's not really out of line with normal primate evolutionary development, but it is, it is very big. And, and we have language, of course, and dedicated areas of the brain for language, and that does seem to be the one area where people are very different from animals. But over the last 40 or 50 years, every area that's been claimed as being unique to humans, the ability to deceive, the ability to cooperate, um, altruism, um, complex problem solving, all one after another have been conceded to other species, and interesting, a lot of them, uh, to, um, to birds. The Aesop's fable about the, the crow dropping stones into a pitcher to raise the water level to drink is true. Nathan Emery um, and, and uh, colleagues in, in, uh, in London showed that if you give crows access to stones and a tube of water with a mealworm floating on the surface of the water, they'll pick up the stones and put it in. And moreover, the results on the right show that they very quickly learn that the, the big stones are better than the small stones. All right. Um, so I've concluded my, my talk. But I'd like to just emphasize that the changes that have happened in the last 40, 50 years are happening in a sense at an accelerating pace. And there is, as Anna says, this feeling of excitement that we really are getting closer, at least to having the tools and the concepts to understand how this remarkable organ works. Thank you. <laughs>